Hello, everyone, and welcome back to BFG Financial Advisors webinar series. Uh, for those that are new, my name is Cody Niedermeyer. Uh, I'm an associate here at BFG and uh, webinar host. And for those that are returning, welcome back. Um, for those that are returning, we have a continuing guest, Eric Brotman, who is founder of BFG. He is a webinar host of or podcast host of Don't Retire, Graduate. And Eric, we're, we're very happy to have you again this year. I'm glad to be here. I, I, it's amazing that we've done 12 of these in 2021, and it's uh, it's been a whole lot of fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's funny that it stems from a quick marketing meeting and an idea, and all of a sudden we have a we have an ongoing webinar series that uh, you know we continue to get more and more viewers each week or each month. Excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know it's. Normally we're we're in our studio and we're doing some construction here because the firm's growing. So I, I I get to be in my own natural element in my office now today. Yeah, I was actually going to address it because I think this is the first time I'm in a different room as well, and uh, I'm sure we were going to get some questions after the webinar. But uh, before we get started, Eric, I just wanted to make a note that obviously this is the 12th webinar of the year for us, um, and we definitely wanted to leave time for some questions at the end, just to kind of sum up the year right, or as our title of our webinar is, ending the year right. Um, so please send those question in, questions in. We have our marketing director who's going to be organizing those and ready to address some of them and all the ones that we can get to today. Uh, but please don't hesitate in uh, putting those in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. And I think without further ado and no other introduction, uh, I think I think we get this thing started and we open up the floor. Eric, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's do it. Everyone's favorite disclosure slide. And let's get this thing going. So this is a very generic slide, but I think it has a lot to do with uh, everyone's favorite thing to do at the end of the year and the start of new year of coming up with uh, kind of your yearly resolutions. Um, so I pulled a few from, you know, a couple articles and some, th some things we've talked about in the past, Eric. So I, I think it'd be good if we can just touch on a few of them, uh, starting with, you know, sticking to your savings rate or possibly going into the new year, raising it. Well, it, and, be and before we get into the micro level, just on a macro level, real fast, yes. um, I think new year's resolutions are probably the wrong way to look at this. And I, okay. I know we've talked about it, but people don't follow new year's resolutions my new year's resolution every year is to lose weight and get in better shape and while i feel like i'm working out like a fiend i'm not losing weight or getting in better shape per se so some of it is what are the things that we can do going into the new year to uh, uh, allow us to start the year right but also things that we can sustain mm -hmm. because you, you know you, you you don't you don't want a new year's re re resolution to be derailed come mid-january and then wait until the following january to try and get it back on track so Absolutely. with that said, you talk about the savings rate. This is a great time to adjust a, a savings rate. And what I mean by a savings rate is if you're putting away 8% of your gross income and you can get that to 9 or 10 or 11, um, that will make a difference over time in a profound way. A lot mm -hmm. of people have annual employee reviews this time of year and, and folks get you know cost of living increases or, or bonuses or uh, other raises it's a perfect time to bump up whatever you're doing in terms of your your savings rate um there are also new employee benefits and i know that the you know some of the employee benefit limits have gone up the hsa limit has gone up for health savings accounts the 401k limits have gone up for employees um this might be the year in which you're turning 50 or you're turning 55 in which case i know you're not cody but i am so it, it's an opportunity to it's an opportunity to uh, increase your contributions further based on catch up provisions and other kinds of things. So this is the time to take stock. A lot of times employee benefits renew January one. A lot of times um, things are indexed January one, and a lot of times people get um, compensation adjustments January one. And so it's the perfect time to take stock and do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, you kind of stole my thunder and I had a note here just to touch on those 401k increases for those, you know, that previously were maxing out the contribution at $19,500 a year. Um, that's getting increased by $1,000. So it's going to be the 20500 starting in 2022. And then if you're able to make a catch up contribution, instead of the 26000 you can actually put in 27000 And like you said, any little increase over the long haul, can really make a big difference in you know what your retirement can look like. It pays to be 50. <laughs> it definitely pays to be 50 in some ways. 
Uh huh. I'm ha I'm happy you see it that way. But, uh, <laughs> but I think building off of that, um, and just coming into the year end, uh, there's another point in kind of a resolution or that we're not using, but a goal that can be sustained throughout the year and just kind of checking yourself is the idea of you know refinancing, and that doesn't necessarily only mean your mortgage, but the possibility possibly student loans or you know your cars and stuff and do you think it's a good time to kind of take a peek at that and just you review where your current finances are at i mean it, it's funny i've been saying that interest rates can't stay this long forever mm -hmm. forever uh, <laughs> there comes a point in time where that that can't and we're beginning to see inflation we're beginning to see rate increases the fed mm -hmm. has tipped their hand a little bit that we're going to see some additional increases so i i think this is and again i've said this before that it's it's your last chance well it it has to be at some point our last chance so if you have any variable rate debt and you can get it fixed this is still a good time to do it if you're looking to do projects on your home and you need additional capital it's an excellent time to do a cash out refinance if that's something important to you um, if you have um, just in general sometimes your lines of credit are based upon various uh, asset values so if you have a home equity line of credit your home may be more valuable now than it was a year ago. We're seeing that across the country. So if that's true, it might be a good time to request a line increase just to have more dry powder. Mm -hmm. um, if the cash value in your life insurance has grown in value, you might be able to increase your cash value line of credit. If your portfolio has grown in value and you have a securities backed line of credit, you may be able to increase your credit lines right now because asset values are, are particularly high. So not only is it a good time to fix debt and refinance it, uh, it's also a good time to make sure that you have dry powder where you need it. Uh, I would also say I, I, I am not a huge fan of debt. I understand leverage and I think leverage can be good. Yeah. There's never a better time to um, to reduce debt than the present. And that's true at all times. But <laughs> if, you're, if you're fortunate enough to have gotten a raise or a bonus or anything for year end and you can either pay down debt or eliminate some or start increasing your payments to some of those things monthly, that counts toward your savings rate too. If your savings rate isn't just what you're growing, it's also how you're improving your balance sheet by by reducing debt. Yeah, I mean, now's the perfect time to take a, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but just a review of all of that, as you've said. Inventory. Um, and, the yeah. word is inventory. This is the, inventory. This is the time that, to figure out where you are. That's the word, I'm struggling this morning. Have but, the 2022 roadmap and a sticker that says you are here. And that's that's where are you you are here and that's that's what inventory means and this is a great time january one's a perfect time to do that once a year no i love that and once again building off that and looking into next year we've talked about you know possibly increasing salary or maybe you've accumulated some things over the year to also take a look at you know your property and casually and a look at an umbrella policy and kind of all those things because your financial world has changed throughout the year and it might be a good idea to you know make sure your personal liability coverages are covering that it, it's it's been an interesting year there's been um a, sort of a almost elimination of the middle class uh, you know the wealthy people have gotten wealthier and folks who are struggling have become more um uh, have, have struggled more unfortunately um, if you're in the camp where you're growing wealth and, you're, and your wealth has grown significantly over the last year or two, your personal liability umbrella with your property and casualty insurance company ideally should cover or approximate your net worth. So yeah. if you were worth $2 million three years ago and you have a $2 million umbrella and now you're worth $2.8 million, you might want to get a $3 million umbrella. And these are generally not super expensive, but they are good for asset protection and you can work with whoever you, whichever insurance companies you work with will offer these. No, yeah. Um, and I guess the last kind of idea that I wanna bring up because I think a lot of people tuned into this webinar to hear about tax efficiencies and different things you can do before year end is again on the, the line of inventory is reviewing your estate documents. And I know we've talked about these in previous uh, webinars that we've hosted, whether it be with you or some of the other principals here at BFG. But I think we wouldn't be doing uh, any viewers of this or listeners of this justice if we didn't uh, discuss reviewing your state docs or getting state documents uh, executed for the first time. Well, if, if you don't have them, by all means, get them. And, and that, includes, that includes for your kids who are 18 and older. 
You know, people fail to do that a lot. And, you know, our, our parental rights go away at the age 18 typically. And so, you know, we can't make, if our, if our 19 year old child's in an accident, we can't make medical or financial decisions for them without them having given us written permission to do so. And that's part of why to do that. Um, yeah. you know, earlier this year, there was a lot of proposed legislation in Washington, D.C. about uh, tax policy, about IRAs, about 401ks, about capital gains, about income tax brackets. And so much of it is still in flux that it's extremely difficult to do estate planning at the moment. Um, yeah. The estate planning council, both nationally and here in Baltimore, have been uh, very much on the forefront of discussing what those options are and what those opportunities are. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you have an estate plan right now that, that you're comfortable with uh, and that's reasonably up to date, say five years or less, you may not want to do something immediately. But keep your keep your ear to the ground because the the legislation that's coming could change the way um, capital gains are, are created or, or, or taxed. They could change the way step up and basis occurs. They could create additional need for different trust planning. Um, at one point, it looked like they were going to do away with grantor trusts and the life insurance trust and some of the things that that a lot of clients uh, utilize. Just make sure that you've had a conversation with your attorney. And that you, you're you are speaking with him or her and or, or their firm and saying what do I need to change based on these circumstances? It might be that we don't have clarity to any of that until later in 22. Um, and 22 yeah. being a, a, an election year in the midterms, usually we don't see a whole lot of tax policy change in the year of an election because folks are afraid to damage their re-election potential with with tax policy. So I don't know that we'll see a whole lot of change if it doesn't happen imminently. Yeah. And kind of just discussing estate planning documents, I was just, uh, it just started to make me think of, you know, when we bring on new clients or we start working with new clients and the idea of, please check your beneficiaries. I think a lot of people are surprised um, when we ask for beneficiary confirmation statements or we work with them and we're talking to them and we figure out, you know, beneficiaries haven't been updated since you first went into your 401k plan and things change. You have children. Uh, divorces happen and a lot of people are surprised by the you know the person or people that they currently have lifted or listed as beneficiaries on certain accounts it's true and unfortunately when when it's too late there there's no going back so making yeah. sure that that your wishes in your will are in reasonable harmony with the beneficiaries mm -hmm. in your retirement accounts iras life insurance policies and other uh, pensions and so forth makes a huge amount of sense and get it in writing yes. unfortunately don't I, get it in writing make sure it's verifiable because while we'd love to trust that uh the call center got it right when we called in if, if we don't see it in writing we just we can't yeah no i just one more thing to review uh coming to the year end and kind of getting started fresh with next year but uh i think uh i think that touches on a lot of the a lot of the big topics other than what we're about to get into, which is everybody's favorite of uh, finding ways to reduce their tax bills. And this is an intro slide. We have some more specific slides that we're gonna work through. Um, and, you know, I like to start personally with the idea of, you know, charitable gifts from retirement accounts and ways that that can be used. Um, a lot of people don't know the term, but should know the idea of a required minimum distribution and uh, definitely other ways where charitable gifts can be made to reduce that tax bill. There are lots of acronyms in the financial world. It's kind of like government. There's a, an acronym for everything. So your RMD or your required minimum distribution is what's required to be taken from inherited IRAs or inherited Roth IRAs if uh, you've inherited them from someone other than your spouse. And that's regardless of your age. Um, and the rules changed recently to now where instead of an annual requirement, there's a 10 year rule. And so if you're not sure if you've inherited an IRA or Roth IRA and you're not sure what to do, seek advice right away because the failure to take required distributions creates an enormous tax penalty. It's 50%, yeah. which is gruesome. Um, the other acronym that a lot of folks are, are aware of with the RMDs is your QCD, your Qualified Charitable Distribution. Mm -hmm. The ages for these used to be the same, and now they're not. RMDs for your own accounts now do not begin on an IRA or a 401k or other type of account until you're 72. Mm -hmm. But the qualified charitable distribution is still allowed at 70 and a half. 
<laughs> because why not? Yep. So if you if you have a, a required distribution from your IRA and it's going to be taxable and you don't really need the money, if you're making charitable gifts and you're over 70 and a half, you can give up to $100,000 a year to charity directly from your IRA, not pay the ordinary income tax on it. Of course, the charity doesn't pay tax on it. You get the full deduction for your charitable giving if you're itemizing and if it's large enough to do so. Yep. Uh, and it counts toward your required distribution. So you don't have to take your distribution and pay taxes and then also make a gift. So I don't know that there's a more powerful way to gift property on an annual basis than from an IRA or 401k. Um, but you do have to be 70 and a half to do that. And fortunately, I'm while I'm celebrating 50, I'm not 70 and a half. So that one doesn't apply to me, Cody, despite the way you might feel about it. Um, uh -huh. I have so some thoughts. So charitable gifts from retirement accounts are a very powerful tool for people over 70 and a half who are charitably inclined and want to make a difference. Yeah. And, you know, we see it a lot with our clients that, you know, the idea of the charitable gift coming from that account and avoiding having to pay the tax to the government, I think a lot of people find it extremely beneficial. But when, let's say you're not looking at a retirement account, and I know that's getting a little bit away from this slide, uh, what types of assets, you know, make the most sense if you're looking to make a charitable contribution to, you know, an organization, a church, or, you know, whatever, whatever really motivates you? If you're making gifts and you're under 70 and a half, or if you don't have the bandwidth to make them from your IRA, mm -hmm. you can give gifts that are cash or you can give gifts that are in securities. Okay. So a current gift. So if you own stock in XYZ company. And let's say you bought the stock for $10 a share and now it's worth $100 a share. If you were to sell the stock, you'd have to pay a very large capital gain on the sale. So a lot of times people avoid selling for that reason. You can gift the shares directly to the charity. Don't sell it. If you sell it, you have to pay taxes on it. But if you gift the shares, the shares get gifted. They get what's called a carryover basis. So the basis is the same once the gift happens. But yep. charities are exempt from capital gains, so they pay no tax at all. So if you want to make a $10,000 gift to a religious organization or a school or whatever, um, you can do it with stock and avoid some of the taxes yourself, which amplifies your gift. You still get the full deduction. Now, we can't talk about charitable giving without talking about the rules regarding standard uh, deductions versus itemizing deductions. Absolutely, yeah. Because the, the rules changed uh, in 2020 so significantly that most families don't itemize anymore, mm -hmm. which means you're only allowed to take that little above the line, I think it's a $300 or $600 uh, dis, uh, uh, charitable contribution above the line if you don't itemize. Mm -hmm. So in order to make sure that you're maximizing the tax benefit of your charitable giving, you want to make sure that you're making as many gifts as possible in the same tax year as you can. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of clients using what are called donor advised funds. Yeah. A donor advised fund allows, let's say, let's say Cody, that you're, you're feeling generous. You want to give your alma mater $10,000 a year and you always give them $10,000 a year. It's very thoughtful, mm -hmm. but you don't itemize. Instead of making a gift of $10,000, whether it's stock or cash or whatever, you could set up a donor advised fund and make a gift of 50 or $100,000 to the donor advised fund, take the deduction now, but have the donor advised fund send $10,000 a year to your favorite charity. So that you can, and you can choose any which way you want to distribute that. Once it gets into the fund, that's what makes it a deduction for you. Now, once it's in there, you can't take it back. There's no reneging on the gift. Yeah. <laughs> If, if you are going to make a five-year pledge, instead of writing five checks in five years, if you have the bandwidth to do it, write one check to a donor advised fund in that year and then let the donor advised fund write the five checks, that way you'll get the most tax benefit out of the gift. And in a perfect world, you're going to want to time that not only so you itemize, but you're also going to want to time it so that it happens in a year where you have a, a higher than normal income. So if you're a commissionable salesperson or you're, uh, or, or you're subject to wild fluctuations of income or you're planning, your, your spouse is planning to retire in two years and so you're only going to have one income in the house instead of two, try to make the charitable gifts and take the deductions in the years where your income is the highest because that's mm -hmm. when you'll benefit from them the most. Yeah. 
Um, I think that's a great point and definitely something that we work on with our clients and kind of pair up and working with tax professionals and CPAs um, and the teamwork and camaraderie of it is really what make these things worthwhile. Um, but to kind of reel us back in and kind of moving on to our next topic, mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of questions and I've actually already saw one in the chat that was asking about the idea of converting, you know, your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, a new one or one that's already established and when that might make sense. It, it, that, that is a, that is a nine headed Hydra of a question. Lots oh, of, a lot, there are lots of different what ifs. Um, yes. And there's lots of different opinions over whether this is a good strategy or not. You might run into a, a CPA who thinks this is the greatest thing ever and another one who thinks it's terrible. Um, and so I think it's got to be right for the right person. Yeah. Unlike the charitable giving, which you want to do when your income is abnormally high, converting an IRA to a Roth is something you want to do when your income is abnormally low. Yeah. Now, the reason to convert an IRA to a Roth IRA is so that you have some control over the timing and the taxation of your yeah. IRA distributions. There is no income limitation on Roth conversions. There's also no age limitation on Roth conversions, so anyone can do them. However, if you're in a higher tax bracket now than you're likely to be in the future, it doesn't make sense to, to pay taxes at your higher rate now just to grow the corpus of what's left, um, to grow the corpus in the Roth. You also have to make sure that you have enough cash to pay the taxes due on the conversion. You don't want to take the converted money and then make a withdrawal from it. Yeah. So in other words, Cody, if you had $100,000 in an IRA and you wanted to move it to a Roth, and let's say you're for round numbers, you're in a 25% tax bracket. Mm -hmm. When you convert that $100,000 from the traditional to the Roth IRA, you're going to pay $25,000 in taxes in that year, assuming the 25%. Mm -hmm. You have to have the $25,000 by April 15th, and you have to have it someplace other than the IRA, or you're compounding your tax problem. Now, once that $100,000 gets into the Roth IRA, It'll grow for the rest of your life under current tax rules. I have to say that because you never know what Congress might do. Um, yeah. You know, knucklehead one and knucklehead two could find a way to mess this up no matter when it is. But <laughs> under current rules, the Roth IRA is never taxed again during your lifetime or your spouse's. And when it's inherited from you, you know, by your children, your children have 10 years to drain the account, but it's still not taxable money during that time. Okay. So timing a conversion of an IRA to a Roth IRA, you want to really plan for. So for example, the times we see this to be most valuable, let's say that you're retiring, you're retiring and you're 63 years old. Mm -hmm. And your plan is set up such that you don't expect to claim social security or other types of pension income or other things until you're 70. Okay. I'm making this up. If your paychecks end at 63 and your additional ordinary income starts at 70, with Social Security, or 72 with your RMDs, for example, which we talked about, doing some conversions during that intermediate period yeah. might be a way to do them at 15% or 10% taxation instead of 25, 28, 33 or more. So planning for this and recognizing there's often a gap between your working years and your taking distributions either from IRAs or Social Security that you can use that to time these conversions that becomes incredibly powerful yeah no i think you kind of hit it nail on the head there um i do see another question that i think is important at this time of just the idea of the term they use bracket creep and mm -hmm. the, uh, if you do the conversion to kind of avoid that uh what's the best way of going about that is it working with a financial advisor is it working with your cpa or is it you doing uh, back of the envelope math and trying to trying to figure out, you know, how much can I convert without getting into the next bracket? I think it's all of the above. I think some people okay. do the back of the envelope just fine. Other people would rely on their financial professional or tax professional. In general, the, the tax tax rates uh, on taxable income are published, and you can see what they are in 21 online at the IRS.gov. You can see what they are in 2022, um, and so. If, if you know, for example, that as a married couple filing jointly, you need to keep your income over under $350,000 in a given year, mm -hmm. and your income is 160, you know, you have $150,000 relatively easily of bandwidth that you can do a conversion before you jump into the next tax bracket. So yeah. bracket creep is this idea that you hit these thresholds where the next dollar is taxed more than the last dollar. Okay. But there's more to it than that. 
having those conversions is in fact taxable income. It matters what state you live in. If you live in a high tax state, but two years from now you're retiring to a low or no income tax state, don't do the conversions now because you're gonna pay your state. Wait until you've moved and then do the conversions if that's appropriate for you. You might save eight, 10, or in California, 13% or whatever it is. Um, so that plays a role. I, I think there's more to it than just that, but okay. bracket creep in and of itself is, is one of the issues. The other is if you are 65 and you're on Medicare, having even that gap between 65 and 70, if you've delayed Social Security, you don't have RMDs yet, converting those IRAs to Roth IRAs creates ordinary taxable income, which will increase your Medicare premiums. Yeah. And so be aware that there's more than just the conversation on what is my tax bracket. There's also what are my other costs? What are my other, what are the other impacts of this decision? As you make more money in this country, you get taxed in lots of different ways. It feels like a game of whack-a-mole. So yeah. if if you do a, a conversion of an IRA to a Roth IRA and your income then becomes higher than you expected or than you're used to, it'll have a ripple effect on some of your other some of your other techniques. Yeah. No, I'd I'd I'm laughing over here because, you know, the answers kind of always seem to find their way of there is no blanket statement and it depends. And this is just a case in point of, you know, everybody's different. There's going to be, you know, the right thing to do for somebody is not going to be the right thing to do for the another or another or the person sitting at the desk next to you. Uh, so just right. think of the idea, it always comes back to it depends. That's right. I agree. <laughs> but uh, building off this, um we had some more questions and it feeds into this uh this new slide of you know is it time to recognize gains and i think it's important to understand uh the difference between short-term capital gains uh long-term capital gains possible losses and comparing all those so if you could start at fifty thousand feet maybe we we work our way down and start with what are these types of gains um, and then, you know, does it make sense for somebody to look to do that in this year? Uh, I think it'd be really appreciated. Capital gains tax is, was, was created essentially to, um, to require the recognition of taxes at the point in time where you sell a capital asset for more than you bought it for. So you buy a piece of real estate for $100,000, you sell it for $500,000, you have a $400,000 gain. Same thing with shares of stock or bonds or business interests or other things, if it's capital, that means it's not earned income, it's not salary, it's, okay. it's the sale of, a, of, a, of an investment asset of some kind, all right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of exceptions for primary residence or there's exchanges you can do to defer the gains and there's, there's a lot more to it than we can possibly answer today. Mm -hmm. um, but the short answer is the difference between long-term and short-term gains is profound mm -hmm. because any asset you've held more than a year, a year and a day, gets a favorable capital gains tax rate, whereas anything held less than that, you pay at the ordinary income tax rate. Mm -hmm. So the difference could be very significant. So rarely is it a good idea to sell something you've owned less than a year, okay. uh, because the short-term capital gains will clobber you. Now, you can take losses. So, you know, Cody, you bought that piece of real estate for $100,000, now it's worth 80, because you chose poorly. There's a $20,000 loss, you can use that $20,000 loss to offset gains in some other place. So let's say okay. you bought one stock and lost $20,000 on it. You bought another stock and you gained $30,000 on it. Those are netted and your net long-term capital gain there is $10,000, 30 minus 20. Okay. You only pay taxes on the net. Now, your losses can be carried forward against your ordinary income, but only $3,000 a year. So there is a schedule in your tax returns with your 1040 called the Schedule D that lists capital gains okay. and losses each year. You have to be aware if there's a carryover loss from the prior year. Because let's say, let's say that piece of real estate we talked about, you lost $20,000, you have a $20,000 capital loss. You use three of it that year against your ordinary income for tax calculation, but you still have 17 left. Next year, you start the year at negative 17,000. So you can take the first $17,000 of capital gains you take that year are not going to be taxed. Anything above that will. And if you don't use it all, you can use another $3,000 toward ordinary income. So your question about should we recognize some capital gains in 2021, six months ago, I thought absolutely yes. Three months ago, I thought probably not. And now I'm not sure. And yeah. 
for that is because Capitol Hill keeps changing their minds. So there was talk about raising capital gains rates or even eliminating favorable capital gains rates for folks over certain income levels as of January 1st of 22. Mm -hmm. so when we're hearing that in June, we're thinking, oh my goodness, we're going to want to pay as many taxes as we can on the portfolio this year if it's appropriate for us so we can pay it at 10 or 15 or 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Then the legislation changed in September. They said, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it retroactively to where we said, whoa, well, if that's the case, we don't want to sell anything because we don't even know what the rate's going to be or, or if, yeah. if it's retroactive, we're going to get clobbered anyway. So let's not sell anything. And right now, there's been no material change. There's gridlock for a change in D.C. And so right now, I would say the only reason to recognize capital gains this year, long-term gains this year, number one is if you have a bunch of carryover losses. Number mm -hmm. two, if you have a portfolio that's grossly out of balance, because okay. some securities have really had incredible years, um, some asset classes have had incredible years, and if you need to rebalance an account, you may be paying some capital gains to do it. I still think that's generally the right thing to do. Um, you know, if, if you know U.S. stocks outperform just about every other sector in the last stretch of time, and so if that's the case, you might, if you intended to hold 50% of your portfolio in U.S. stocks, and now it's 58%, this might be a time to pare back, make sure your diversification and your asset allocation are correct, and that would mean paying some capital gains to reduce that position. Um, but in terms of doing it as tax arbitrage, Unless you're in an abnormally low bracket for some reason, you you are between jobs, you didn't work this year, or or your pay took a hit because of COVID or something, where you can be in a lower bracket. I don't think we want to recognize gains just to do it from a tax perspective. I think that's referred to as the tax tail wagging the financial dog. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of those cases where even though it looks pretty good on paper, I, I don't I don't think we have enough evidence to support it right now. Yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's very fair to say the legislation has been uh, keeping us and people in this industry and uh, a lot of others just on their on their toes and uh, kind of yeah. waiting for to see what's next and the best way to plan accordingly. We have to be ready for almost anything, and yeah. usually it comes out of left field at the last minute, and you, then there's some head scratching that happens. Yep, <laughs> it's usually how it goes. But uh, building off of that. Um, the idea of multi-generational planning, you know, gifting to the next generation, uh, your children, your grandchildren, family. Um, I think I think this is an extremely important uh, topic and one of the big ones we have in our office with what we do. Um, so I think just getting an idea of, you know, maybe some tax efficiencies and the way of gifting uh, would be beneficial. Cody, this slide is only here in case my mom and dad are watching, because I'm, I'm hoping that that would be considered this year for me. I'm only I kidding. was hoping the same thing. I'm only kidding. All right. So <laughs> gifting to the next generation is something a lot of us want to do. You know, I, yes. I, anytime I have the opportunity to, to, to transition wealth to my own daughter, I, I, I love to do that. Um, there are ways to do it properly and ways to do it, I won't say improperly, but inefficiently. Um, and so certain kinds of gifts are more powerful than others. You know, you don't want to gift highly appreciated stock to the next generation. And the reason for that, you know, we use that example where you bought stock for $10,000 and now it's worth $100,000. Mm -hmm. If you gift it to your children, they're going to have the same $10,000 basis you did. So when they sell the stock, they're going to have to pay gains on the $90,000. Yeah. If you hold that until you until you die, under current tax law, there's a step up in basis. Your kids could inherit it and, not, and they, their basis would be 100,000, they'd pay no taxes on it. So some gifts just don't make sense. Um, the, the gifts that make the most sense, I think, are, are those that, are, that have tax benefits to them and can be transformative. And the two biggest, uh, and the two we use the most, one is in 529 plans for college savings. And the reason, we did a webinar on this earlier this year, but the reason those are so powerful is that you can gift the money, but still own and control it. It's outside of your estate. Your kids are the beneficiaries. They can use it for up to $10,000 a year for a private school. They can use it for college. They can use it for grad school. Or even more powerfully, if the account has grown to a certain size and they don't need it, you know, they get a soccer scholarship or something, um, the next thing that happens is they can change it or you can change the beneficiary. And it could roll to a grandchild or it could roll to a great grandchild. And it yeah. all still continues to be tax deferred. So 529s are powerful. 
even if your kids don't use everything you put away, depending on your situation though. Don't gift money you might need, gift yeah, money you don't need. Um, next piece of that is, um, is whole life insurance, which we use and we've done talks on this as well. The idea of insuring your kids and your grandkids' lives because it creates tax-free wealth transfer um, is such a powerful strategy and it's such a powerful way to preserve insurability and it, it's beyond the scope of this webinar to go into details, but yeah. there is a resource at lowtaxbook.com that talks about both the 529 and the whole life strategy and they, they really are phenomenal, phenomenal ways to transition wealth between generations without giving up full control. You know, people are always afraid to gift too much um, because they worry, what if something happens and I need it? When you make those kinds of gifts, if you do it right, you still have some control over them in case, in case there's a scholarship or in case there's a medical need for you or in case something else happens in your lives. So you can, you can do these things without giving up full control. Uh, and I think that's powerful. There used to be a lot of tax planning around, for example, uh, family owned businesses or farms or, yeah. or, or other kinds of things where you would create family limited partnerships and gift minority interests to your kids. And there were a lot of, I'm not gonna call them shenanigans because quite frankly, it was solid tax planning. Yeah. So much of that applies to such a small percentage of the population that in general, if we're going to keep this at 50,000 feet, as you like to say, um, mm -hmm. in general, uh, the, the things that most parents or grandparents can do are the 529s, the, the whole life insurance. If you've got a kid who's 14 and who's working part time someplace, you can fund a Roth IRA in his or her name. Um, it doesn't have to be payroll deducted. So if they earned $4,000 last year, you could put $4,000 in a Roth IRA for them and it can grow for the rest of their lives tax-free. There's things like that you can do. Those are irrevocable gifts, but they're also priceless. Any place you can put money where it's never taxed again, sign me up. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And uh, to kind of cover my cover my own butt on this one, uh, I just wanted to include a slide of, you know, is there anything, we talked about a lot of things that I believe you should be doing every year around this time, mm -hmm. but is there anything else that comes to mind of things that you should be doing every year, whether it's looking at your finances once or twice throughout the year, just to make sure everything's on track. Uh, we talk a lot about setting it and forgetting it, but um, is there anything else that you can think of that you know people who view this webinar should be doing annually? I think first and foremost, you should treat your financial plan a little bit like you treat your healthcare, which is okay. you want to get a physical exam every I mean, you, you don't yeah. go to the doctor for a physical exam necessarily because something hurts and you certainly don't go hoping they'll find something wrong with you, but you go because it's like getting your oil changed. There's just certain things that you do routinely for maintenance of your health. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the same thing is true on the financial side, that if you, if you do, um, we call them annual strategy meetings, but if you do physical exams for your finances every year and you really stress test everything, it gives you a chance to recalibrate, make sure that that uh, that everything's in tip top shape, that you're making the right decisions, that you're still on track. Um, yeah. and it's not necessarily just about, for example, investment performance. It has that, that certainly plays a role, but so does income, so do tax rates, so does inflation, so do uh, interest rates. And so recalculating, if you've got this goal that you wanna be in the Mediterranean on a yacht when you're 73 mm -hmm. and you're currently 48, and you have 25 years to get there, you know, next year you have 24 years, year after that you have 23 and so forth, making sure you, you move the you are here sticker and that you continue on that trajectory is, I think it's worth doing once a year. I don't think you have to do it every month. People keep spreadsheets of their, of their assets and they go up and down every five minutes. And I mean, I don't think that's particularly helpful or healthy. Um, I, I think it's okay to do a portfolio review regularly. I think it makes sense to rebalance once a year or so. There are things that can be done, but for the most part, just get a physical exam and let your doctor tell you which specialist you need. And in this case, let your certified financial planner practitioner tell you which specialist you need. Do you need a mortgage broker? Do you need an insurance agent? Do you yeah. need a banker? Whatever it is. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a perfect transition. And this is showing kind of, we're towards the end of our slideshow, but we're leaving times for those questions. But, you know, we, we talked about reaching those goals, you know, working with your certified financial planner practitioner. And, you know, there's, easy, there's an easier way to do it than just doing it by yourself. 
So I think it's important just, you know, to kind of sum up the year of, you know, what is the benefit of having a certified financial planner practitioner um, or a financial advisor? Um, as I can see with the sheer number of questions that we've gotten during this webinar, you know, people have questions. They don't understand the ins and outs of everything that we've even discussed today only on this webinar, and there is so much more out there. Um, so I think it's important to uh, just kind of touch on how we could be beneficial or, you know, other financial advisors out there could be beneficial to someone. Just in general, I think a, a, a CFP practitioner who does those annual physicals, we use the yeah. medical analogy, but I'll also use the analogy of a trainer at the gym. Yep. All of us know how to do, I presume, a push-up and a sit-up or, or, or crunches, but um, a lot of times people need not only a sounding board and accountability, but also some coaching to make sure they're doing it properly. You can really hurt yourself at the gym by doing it wrong. Um, same thing's true financially. Making a big mistake is often, uh, it, it often has more damage, does more damage than making good decisions all along the way can, can yeah. clean up for. So missing the iceberg is better for the journey than the speed of the boat. And so in my opinion, the value of a financial advisor, a, a, a fiduciary financial advisor, is to make sure that you have an advocate, an ally, a, a sounding board, uh, someone to help keep you accountable, and someone to be dispassionate. Someone yeah. who, not, not dispassionate about you as a human being, but dispassionate about financial decisions. Your financial advisor won't be attached to a stock just because of the way you inherited it. Mm -hmm. A financial advisor won't be attached to the price you paid for something because of the, the behavioral issues related to that. Your financial advisor shouldn't wind up in the weeds with some of the things that we that we tell ourselves are important when maybe there's a, another way to look at it and the objectivity matters. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who wouldn't benefit from a second set of eyeballs on their financial plans, um, myself included. I mean, I, I, I have a, another advisor here in the firm who meets with me twice a year and we go over these things and she really pushes me to say, why are you making this decision? Have you considered this? And that perspective matters because when you're in, you know, when you can't see the forest for the trees, it's because you're in it. It's yeah. much easier for somebody outside to take a look at it for you and with you. And I think the value of a, of a financial advisor usually um, it starts with the behavioral and the psychological. There's certainly financial benefits, tax benefits, and accountability benefits, but there's also a lot of times you might not recognize it. In a year where everything's going swimmingly and markets are going straight up, people might say, well, why do I need an advisor? I can do this myself. Mm -hmm. And that might feel true. In some years, maybe it is true. Mm -hmm. But we tend to earn our keep when things go wrong, either in the economy or in markets or in someone's life. And, you know, in the same way that you want your doctor, your doctor might say, oh, I don't need to see you for five years if nothing changes you still might want that annual physical because when something goes wrong, you want to catch it. Yeah. I think that, you know, something that kind of turns a lot of people off to the idea of a financial advisor is there's a majority of financial advisors out there that, you know, they have an idea of like a minimum asset that you need in order to even work with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do a sell of shameless plug just for BFG in general and mostly you and the other principals here at BFG of the idea that we actually implemented this year of financial planning for all where we don't have a set minimum and there's, you know, there's other places out there, but we're, I think we're one of the few who, you know, kind of implemented this program that, you know, everybody should have access to financial planning, access to a certified financial planner practitioner. Um, and we provide an opportunity for that. Um, I just wanted to include that to say, thank you, Eric, and, you know, put that knowledge out there that you don't have to have a certain number of assets to work with financial planner. Um, there are those out there that, you know, are ready and willing to work with you and help you reach your goals. So thank you, Eric. No, that's true. And, and there's a, a website at financialplanningforall.com yeah. that you can visit for more info. I mean, it's, it's, it's really eye opening the number of people who think I'm not wealthy enough to get financial advice. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. It exactly. may might've been turned away three times by other, by other organizations, but, but it's simply not true. There is no yeah. moment where you are wealthy enough to need financial advice. I think we all need financial advice. Absolutely. And uh, with that being said, uh, I know our marketing director, Sarah, I believe you're on the line um, and you've been trying to organize uh, what I'm gonna deem the chaos of our, our chat box. 
with questions that uh, people have been sending out through our entire presentation. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of those. And then for any of the ones that we're not able to to get today, uh, if you guys want to reach out, you, and I'll put Eric's email on the next slide, or you can take a picture or just actually hold your camera up to this barcode on the current PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint slide, excuse me. Um, you can schedule a free consultation with one of our advisors here at BFG, and we'd be more than happy to meet with you and help answer any questions that you might have. So without further ado, Sarah, are you there? So that's more than just a, a, an interesting holiday ornament? That is more than that. We like to, uh, we like to pair it up based on uh, the season, as you can tell. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, Sarah, what do you have for us? All right, guys, um, I do have some questions, but I first want to address some things that have been uh, sent since we started. Uh, for one, yes, this is getting recorded and it's going to be sent by email to anyone who registered for the webinar. So if you are worried that you missed something or didn't pay attention for part or you just want to go back and review it, you are going to get this emailed to you. Mm -hmm. um, someone wanted to clarify that URL for the book about saving on your taxes is lowtaxbook.com. You can also go to brotmanmedia.com and all of our books will be there under the book tab. So now going to those uh, questions, what do I do if I'm worried about my parents' finances? Oh, well, I'm right there with you, first of all. <laughs> uh, and that is something, you know, the, the, the child often becomes the parent at some point during, during the, the lifespan. Um, I, I think if you're worried about your, your parents' finances, the first thing to try to do in as um, gentle a way as possible is to facilitate communication. You know, I, I think it's really important for generations to to communicate with one another and to be honest and open about where things stand. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to quantify everything, but qualitatively, understanding what's most important to your parents and and what they want and what their objectives are matters. And there are lots of ways to create legacies. Um, if you're concerned that you may wind up being responsible for them financially, I would tell you, be honest with them. Tell them that you you know you'd like to. Um, to have an open and honest conversation about what that might look like, because if you're raising your own children and then have to pay some of your parents' bills, that can be very onerous and very difficult. Um, finding out if your parents have long-term care insurance, if they have their legal documents done, um, you know, if you're a responsible party for them, all those things um, should come out in conversation. And if you're feeling, and understandably so, if you're feeling uncomfortable with the idea of broaching that subject with your parents, Talk to your own financial advisor and ask if he or she will will have a meeting with uh, and including your parents so that they can be the ones um, to initiate some of that conversation. And it doesn't have to be about how much money do you have, mom and dad. That's off-putting and can feel threatening. Um, it's more along the lines of what would you like to see happen with anything important to you when you go? And that's where I think your financial advisor isn't isn't a therapist. And we're not mediators, but we can run family summits and have those conversations in a way that's pretty non-threatening um, and that hopefully will make folks comfortable. You know, we have a legacy client program here where we'll actually work with our clients' parents uh, or their kids, their grown children. Uh, and we do so at a, at a not only a reduced rate, but in a, in a profound way where they have, they have their own advisor here in the firm. So they have their own advocate. Yeah. And I, I think it's just incredibly powerful if, if they're willing to do it. But I feel your pain. I'm right there with you. I mean, that, that is a, a very scary thing to be thinking about as the sandwich generation. Do we have to pay bills upstream and downstream? And the answer is sometimes. All right. I think that was a great answer. Um, moving on to another question. I know this is one that Eric loves to talk about. It's his favorite thing. All of my friends are on stock market apps and saying they can turn a few dollars into hundreds overnight. Should I be doing that too? Knock yourself out. No, I, I, I think most of the time, most of the time, uh, what I see is those apps have gamified something that was never meant to be a game. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, who doesn't enjoy a video game where you're getting badges and stars? And I mean, I, I wear a Fitbit. I like to get my steps every day. I get it. But when you're talking about real money and you're talking about your nest egg, 
um, entrusting that to something that, that gives you a, a badge for making three trades in the day is probably not the best way to treat it. Um, I do think robo-advisors, for lack of a more graceful term, I do think they play a role. I do think that computers can, can help with asset allocation. They can help with uh, various logarithms. They, they can figure out maybe what makes sense for you based on your input. But most of the time, consumers don't know what questions to ask, and then you really don't have someone to ask it. Um, yeah. I think the human side of it is more important. A computer might say, well, based on your age and your net worth, you ought to hold X. A computer can't say, you know, uh, that must have been incredibly difficult losing your mom, and I understand how difficult it is that the lake house is being shared with you and your two kids, or you and your two siblings, and let's walk through that. Or I know you've spent 40 years growing your career, and now you're looking to exit the business. Let's help make sure that you can sell that. I mean, com computers do a fine job with, with the basics, and if you're just getting started, it's better to do that than not to do anything. But the human element of it, you know, TurboTax did not eliminate the CPA. It just created a simple tool for folks who either don't need or can't afford that kind of tax advice. Um, I really think that, that robo-advisors play a role and the computer systems do can make a difference, but to gamify it, I, I think it's a slippery slope. I think it's a bad idea. Yeah. And Sarah, I think we got time for one more quick one. Sorry, none of my answers are ever quick, Cody. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Very true. Um, okay, going back to when we were talking about that tax rate, um, is a Roth automatically a good decision for everyone now that we're at that low, a low tax rate that's probably going to go up? No. Um, you know, one size fits all never fits anybody. Uh, Roth IRAs are right for some people, but not others. It depends on your income, your age, your health, your marital status, uh, whether you have children or not, your charitable intentions. There are uh, an infinite number of combinations of things that you might want to consider before you, you do that. Um, in the most general of terms, Roth IRAs are best for people who are young, um, uh, who are relatively early in their careers, and who maybe haven't hit their maximum or peak earnings yet. That's a rule of thumb though, and it's not always true. Um, you know, if you're if you're funding a Roth because you expect your tax bracket to be higher later, um, you really have to think about whether that's the right decision. Can you still put the same amount of money in? I mean, if you can max an IRA, but you can't max a Roth IRA because it's after tax dollars, um, you know, that may or may not be a one size fits all solution. So I, I think you really have to look at it case by case. Yeah. Well, Eric, once again, thank you so much. Uh, we started off the year together with uh, the first webinar on the series, and uh, I think we're ending it right by doing one together as well. Um, you know, just your insight and, you know, the information that you've been able to provide everyone, I think is, I mean, I know it's appreciated by me and well beyond based on the people that have uh, tuned into view and clients that I've, uh, that I've worked on with you. So thank you again for being here. Listen, it's been fun, and you know, I, I believe we've reached tens of thousands of people this year. Um, I, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but we've reached an awful lot of people, and and I know the webinars throughout the year have been viewed. Um, you can go back and and look at any of them, um, and they're designed to be evergreen. I mean, we've tried to create a series of Q and A that isn't um, it, it, more timeless than just being timely, so that they don't become obsolete. Uh, and next year we're going to a quarterly format because we have a lot of these topics already out there. So, um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna continue to do these because they've been well received, and I'm having fun. And watching you become a, a really polished host has been a whole lot of fun too. So I, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, no, thank you for that, and definitely a work in progress. But we're gonna continue on with that. Uh, and like Eric said, we're gonna be moving to a quarterly uh, scale moving forward. Uh, so our next webinar is going to be Wednesday, March 30th of 2022. I know it's weird to say, and it's going to be at 11 a.m. And during that webinar, we're going to discuss before, during, and after what to do when you start a new job. And uh, I think I think there's going to be a lot of good information there. But uh, all listeners and viewers, thank you guys for tuning in again. Thank you for a great year. And uh, I know I'm really looking forward to next year. So uh, I'll see you then. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year.